Hi, it's Kate, and this is the second video for week 10 of Math 23. Let's take a look at the nested compact set theorem. These x sub k's here are elements of Rn. They are a decreasing sequence of non-empty compact sets. So what this is saying is that you have x1, x2 is a subset of x1, x3 is a subset of x2, so it's sort of like those Russian nesting dolls. Uh, so, for example, in R, x sub n could be the closed interval from negative 1 over n to positive 1 over n. And so in R2, we can use nested squares, and so on and so forth, up through R3, R4, R5. So what the theorem states is that the infinite intersection of these x sub k's does not equal the empty set. Now, note that we require that these are non-empty compact sets. If we used some x sub k's that were not compact, that were open intervals from 0 to 1 over k, then the infinite intersection is the empty set. The proof, which is in the appendix of Hubbard, starts by choosing a point uh, from each of the sets, then invokes the bolzano weierstrass theorem to select a convergent subsequence y sub i that converges to a point a that is contained in each of the uh, x sub k's, and so is also an element of their intersection because it's in each of them. So that's the general idea of the proof. Let's take a look at the heine borel theorem. The heine borel theorem states that for a compact subset of Rn, any open cover contains a finite subcover. So you might be wondering what's a cover, what's a subcover. In other words, if someone gives you a infinite collection of open sets whose union includes every point in the set X, you can select a finite number of those open sets whose union still includes every point in X. So that's what that means. Um, X is a subset of this finite union of the U's. So the proof, which is also in the, append the appendix, uses this nested uh, compact set theorem. And in general topology where the sets are not necessarily subsets of Rn. The statement, every open cover contains a finite subcover, is actually used as the definition of a compact set. Let's continue on with derivatives in Rn. So if u is an open subset of, subset of Rn and the function f maps from u to R and is defined by this formula where each element uh, in f is x1, x2, x3, x4, those are our inputs in the domain and our output in the codomain will be r, then its partial derivative with respect to the ith variable is just like the limit definition of the derivative here. We take 1 over h as h goes to 0, and we multiply it by the difference in function values. And when we care about the derivative, note how this is written. This is how f is changing with respect to the x sub ith component in the input. It's also written like this, d, the derivative sub i, and that tells you which number variable we're talking about in here of the function f at a is the limit of, as h goes to 0 of 1 over h, and then the difference between the function values is found by only putting the increment h on the particular component that you care about. So when you're looking at the partial derivative with respect to x sub i, you want to look at uh, the ith component here, and that's where you add the increment on this function value, uh, or pardon me, input value. So this does not really give the generalization we want, but it specifies a good approximation to f only along a line through a, whereas a lot of the time we don't really care about just how f is changing with respect to a particular variable. A lot of the time we want to know how f is changing as several different components in the variable are changing. So a lot of the time we don't care just how one of the how f is changing when one of the components changes in the real world a lot of the components are changing all at the same time so that brings us to our next topic now for the directional derivative maybe we don't care how the function f is changing just as one particular component of a is changing maybe we care how f is changing as we're moving along some vector v and that's what the directional derivative is all about so let v be a direction vector of a line through the point a so A is sort of like our anchor point when we do an approximation. That's the function value that we know. And what we, want to, what we care about is when we travel off of A in the direction of V, what happens to our function? So imagine a moving particle whose position as a function of time t is given as A, the stationary point where it starts, plus t times V. t is a scalar. 
Note that when we write the function value, f of a plus tv, that's a function of the single variable t. We know the point where we begin, a. We know the direction we're moving in, b. t is what we normally call a parameter. And that's what's deciding how far away we're sliding out that vector v on some open interval that includes t equals 0. So this is now just a function of the parameter. And the derivative of this function with respect to t is the directional derivative. Now usually, uh, h is normally the limit-taking variable that you see in derivatives. So let's switch that t out and just put h. But the idea of the directional derivative is we take the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus hv, and now there's a typo here, which is why this video is so far in, in coming out, uh, but we should be taking the difference between f at a plus hv minus f of a. So note that we have this notation, which looks like an upside down delta, sub v, that's going to tell us the vector that is the direction that we're heading in, the function whose value we care about, how it's changing, and a is the point where we begin. So it's sort of like the function is centered, quote unquote, at a, and how it changes as we move in the direction of v is what you should look at here. And this we'll get to know sort of as the symbol for the gradient, but that's in a moment further down the page. So if the directional derivative is a linear function of v, in which case f is said to be differentiable at a, then the directional derivative can be calculated if we know its value for each of the standard basis vectors. So what we mean here is basically since we can take the directional derivative in the direction of each of the standard basis vectors, this is the directional derivative of f at a in the direction of each of the standard basis vectors, note that we're missing another subtracting off f of a. So this right here should read as follows. I didn't want to just re-record this video using the new document that we have uploaded because maybe some of you have already printed this. So if you're following along, this is what you should be writing instead. Uh, so this is what the directional derivative in the direction of a basis vector looks like. Note that instead of v, we just put in a basis vector everywhere that v appears up here. And that is written as d sub i of f of a. So you can look at that as the directional derivative of f in the direction of the i-th standard basis vector, but at the point a. So what's interesting is that we can we can write any vector v as a linear combination of standard basis vectors, right? If we're in Rn, any vector in Rn can be written as a linear combination of e1 through en. And so if we want to know how the function is changing as we move in the direction of v, we want to take a look at what all the little components of v are in the direction of the different standard basis vectors, and then sort of break it down and say, well, this is how much uh, f changes in the direction of the first standard basis vector, and we're going to multiply that by whatever the component of v is in the direction of the first standard basis vector. This is how much f is going to change in the direction of the second standard basis vector. We want to multiply how what the second component is of v, which is in the same direction as the second standard basis vector, all the way down, so on and so forth, until we say this is how much f changes in the direction of the nth standard basis vector. And we're going to multiply that by the component of v in the direction of the nth standard basis vector. And so this whole thing is another way of computing what the directional derivative of f in the direction of v would be. We just break down all the other tiny pieces of information we have. Well, in the direction of the first standard basis vector, we have this change, and here's how much v goes in the direction of the first standard basis vector, so on and so forth. Uh, for a more compact notation, we frequently use Jacobian matrices, and this is a row matrix. It's a 1 by n matrix, and it's basically uh, all of the different uh, derivatives with respect to the various variables uh, in order. So if you have x1, x2, x3, x4, so on and so forth like this, this matrix, this is sort of the various variables in our space, Rn, right? There's x1 through xn. This is saying, here's the derivative of f with respect to the first variable. Here's the derivative of f with respect to the second variable. Here's the directional derivative of f with respect to the third variable. And these are all partial derivatives. So these are just all the partial derivatives of this matrix. And yes, if you're looking at this and saying, well, up here she said that these were the directional derivatives of f in the direction of the various standard basis vectors. And now down here she's saying that these are the partial derivatives with respect to the various variables in the space, those are the same thing. So if you want to know uh, what is 
the directional derivative in the direction of e1, that's also the same thing as the partial derivative with respect to x1. So what's happening here is we're taking the partial derivatives in order from the first to the nth. And so if we wanted to uh, calculate what the directional derivative of f in the direction of v would be, all we would have to do is multiply this Jacobian matrix by the vector v. And this is the exact same computation would result because v itself is a nice uh, long column vector that looks like this. And you multiply that by the Jacobian, which is a nice long row vector, and you actually end up with this sum. Let's take a look further down here. Another interesting construction is this vector. It has the partial derivatives with respect to every single variable in order, but as a column vector. So instead of we have a row matrix here, we want a column vector here. This is called the gradient of f. Frequently in other texts, you will start seeing uh, this inverted triangle, gr grad f. Here, that's what we're talking about um, when we say grad. So if you're using a different linear algebra text or you're going on the internet maybe, um, you'll see, or multivariable text, they sort of, it shows up everywhere. You sometimes see instead of grad f, you'll see the inverted triangle that gives our, our uh, gradient symbol. So that's just the column vector of the partial derivatives. And so instead, if we wanted to create this computation here, instead of taking the Jacobian matrix and multiplying it by v, what we can do here is we can take the gradient of f and multiply it, or dot it, pardon me, with v. So we can also find that the directional derivative of f in the direction of v is the gradient dotted the gradient of f at a dotted with v. Note that f is a function, the gradient is a vector that comes from that function. There's some interesting facts about the gradient that we'll discuss later in the course, but very important to, to know how to compute it. It's pretty straightforward. For now, um, we have these differentiable functions, and we'll soon prove that if the partial derivatives of f are continuous, then f is differentiable which is a useful, we can use a useful generalization of the tangent line approximation of single variable calculus. So the idea is, remember that when you had some sort of function like this, and you knew what the function value was at the blue point, but maybe you wanted to find what the function value was at the black point, and so what you would end up doing is you'd use the tangent line. Ooh, this is rough. Sorry, guys. Ay, ay, ay. I like made too sharp of a corner there. Hold on. Anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> You use this tangent line by saying, hey, I know the function value here, and I know the slope of the tangent line here, and I can crawl out the tangent line and say, oh, hey, my approximation is more or less just about there. And it's not exact. There's, you know, the closer you are to the point of evaluation, the better your tangent line approximation is going to be. But we can do the same thing in higher dimensions by saying, hey, to try to approximate the function at a point that's nearby a, all we have to do is take, okay, here's the function value at a, and what I want to do is I want to say, okay, the way to get from a to my point nearby a is to add on hv, and so I want to add on how the function is changing with respect to the uh, first variable, and then multiply how what the distance is between a, plus, a and a plus hv in the first variable, which would just be hv, I want to take how the function is changing with respect to the second variable and multiply that by the second component of hv, so on and so forth, all the way down to the nth, how the function is changing with respect to the nth variable, and multiply that with the, by the nth component of hv. So hv is like an increment of change. jf is the Jacobian, which tells me how much the function value changes based on increments of change. And so you're scaling sort of the effect that each, the change of each of these variables has on the function value itself. And so this is pretty much just like your original tangent line approximation where you would have, where it probably looks something like this, where you said, hey, if x is kind of close to a naught, I say that the function value at x is sort of about the function value at a naught plus how f is changing at a naught times the difference between x and a naught. That's the same thing as this, just sort of doing out all the different partial derivatives and all the different increments of change. This sort of approximation is called an affine approximation, and you'll definitely get some practice with that uh, in some of the sample problems this week.